fellow skeptics in the hubbers, do you know, I'm really flattered that we managed to cling on to some loyal viewers, despite the fact that there's no pub involved. And this is, you know, drink if you want from home. This is water, not gin. But this, this is how we manage during lockdown. Now, tonight we're going to deal with the subject of history. Uh, I don't know whether you were history buffs when you were at school. I wasn't. I was less interested in history as a schoolboy and more interested in science. But since then, I've lived so long that I have considerable history of my own. I can remember going to school on a steam train. I can remember desks with inkwells and dipping pens. I can remember the first vinyl records coming out. All sorts of things like that. You know, when I was a child, colour hadn't really been invented. And I don't just mean colour TV, I mean clothes. Most people wore grey or brown. I mean, even the people who dug up the road wore grey trousers, grey flannel trousers, and white shirts with braces for digging the road. Jeans hadn't come. Anyway, I'm wishing on by a guest, and it's Chris Chair. Here he is. Good how evening. Hello. How Hi. are you, Chris? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. Good, good. Would you like to introduce yourself to our viewers? Yes, yes. Well, I've been involved in local history research for a very long time. Um, and a bit like you, the longer you live, the more you have your own history. And I grew up with a very elderly grandfather, by which I mean when I was four or five, he was nearly 80. Uh, and he lived to be 97. And I think listening to his memories and stories is probably what uh, stimulated my interest in, in the past. Uh, and, that, and that's really grown from there. And I've, um, over the years, written several books on local history topics. And for the last nine or 10 years, I've uh, run heritage projects, um, all in Sussex, on, on various topics. Um, so I get more and more steeped in the history as I go along. You're a local historian, aren't you? Because... Yeah, <laughs> which always sounds a bit pejorative, doesn't it? Because anyone who does any research is immediately called a local historian. I I mean, I've got a great interest in national history, but uh, the way things play out, it's been at the local level that I've been able to, to make a living out of it. Well, the details in the local level, isn't it? I, I remember when, as a schoolboy, I was taught that history was only about royalty, you know? It was about the kings and queens and the battles, and pretty much that was it. Long time yeah, ago. I, it, well, that's right, isn't it? And people often say to me, oh, well, what really happened? Well, you're never going to find out what really happened because people can't even agree what's really happening now. No. So look, at, look at the COVID-19. There'll be all sorts of different views, interpretations. Yes. Um, Brexit the last few years. Yes. No one will agree. So if we can't agree about the present, the chances of agreeing about the past are, are very limited. So all the historian can do, historian can do is give an impression, his yeah. or her own impression, and leave it to other people to make up their own mind. Yes, and very often the impression is delivered by someone in authority who wants to leave a specific prejudiced, propagandized version. Yeah, and that's true in two, uh, two levels. It's true in the sense that documents that historians look at were, as you imply, written with for a purpose. Mm. Uh, and therefore, you have to understand that when you read that document. That this isn't mm. an objective thing. That Someone wrote this uh, often to uh, support and justify their actions. Yeah. But also, historians today uh, are often mo motivated by their own, say, political point of view. So they're selecting elements of the past that back up their ideology. Yes. Um, um, and I always, I've always tried to be influenced by the history to shape my views rather than the other way around. 
um, uh, and I'm always interested that what people at the time thought was significant isn't always what people today with hindsight think was significant. Well, that's right, because of this distortion that is inevitable, really. You can't, there is no objective view, is there? Uh, no, no, you, you couldn't, you couldn't have it. You couldn't have it. Um, I mean, you could, the nearest you can get to it, of course, is to read histories from all sorts of different angles. Mm, mm. Um, um, and sometimes that's easier than others. <laughs> Yes. Uh, there's some historical topics that are sufficiently controversial that there are lots of different interpretations. Yes. But there are others where you may find it harder to get an alternative view. Um, yes. um, I mean, to give an example, um, it's the general view is that Cromwell did awful things in Ireland. Mm -hmm. And probably because of the relationship of Britain to Ireland uh, and that imperialist legacy, um, English historians would be very wary of trying to uh, dispel that belief. So it was actually an Irish historian who wrote a book saying actually Cromwell's behaviour in Ireland compared to what was happening in Europe at the time during the Thirty Years' War was quite moderate. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but really it had to be an Irish historian who said that. Yes. If an English, you know, uh, and and therefore he was able to say it without any accusation of of bias on his part. Nobody in England dared to say anything because it would be off with his head. <laughs> yeah. um, mm -hmm. and, and you know that happens in in many many areas, and and there are some historical topics that are really off limits, uh, and an historian straying into that ground, going against the orthodoxy would find him or herself in a pretty invidious position, I suspect. Mm. Um, we still have them try, though, don't we? What's the uh, the famous um, Holocaust Never Happened guy? Oh, David Irving. Yes. Mm. D David Irving. And, um, he likes to sail against the mainstream. Yes, yes. And then, of course, some people then take a perverse pleasure in doing that. Mm. Um, I mean, we can all go onto Google this evening and find conspiracy theories about just about anything. Yes. And often the people who put these views forward are intelligent people. They're not stupid. Yes. But their their intelligence is mingled with paranoia, and therefore it gets very difficult. Often they ha they are saying things that are worth hearing, but you have to disentangle that from the from the mad stuff <laughs> yes, yes. um and i think the only the only the only test that, that you can do with history or even with now is to keep looking at as many sources as possible never rely on one source mm. try and look as many sources as possible uh, mm. before you you know reach your conclusion mm. well that's something that strikes me as a big difference because coming from a science background my evidence takes a form of phenomena you know actual physical observable items that can be amassed into a collection of data very often mm -hmm. whereas history really it depends on the written word doesn't it um it does i mean a lot of historians in recent times including myself have been a lot more interested in oral history mm -hmm. so going back to how you introduced this evening you know when you were saying about your own memories um and that is fascinating because when you talk to lots of people who all remember the same event they all remember it slightly differently yes but of yes. course you will have consistencies yes so yes. if you interview 30 or 40 people and they all agree on a b and c then you can start to think well maybe that is what happened the consensus view yes. can, but it can be wrong though because sometimes it can be shown that people misremember on a large scale oh yes there's been experiments to show that i don't know whether you're familiar with the um the, the man in a gorilla suit video are you oh you is know? that Dar darren brown where hardly oh. anyone sees the gorilla i don't think it was him but yes it's similar that he's got a, a group of people who are 
playing sort of past the basketball between themselves and they're they're told to focus on how many times they can get it to pass within a specific mm -hmm. duration and while they're doing this a man in a gorilla suit walks past and then afterwards they're interviewed and hardly any of them saw him no no yeah um yeah i think darren brown did a version of that uh, i think how what I've noticed doing oral history, and I've been doing this now for about 25 years, so I've interviewed lots and lots of people. Mm. And in the vast majority of cases, people's memory for when they are a teenager or young adult are very sharp. Yes. And then they get more and more fuzzy and unreliable. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's because as soon as you have a mortgage, a job, a career, children, uh, you lose sight of what's going on around you a bit like the gorilla you know you're so focused yes on yes. the domestic yes that, that that you know a massive tree could have fallen down the road and you know you would forget about it yes, uh, yes. but there are a, a tiny minority of people who have the ability to retain evenly throughout their life memories of their lives wow um yes. bob copper was one of those the um, sussex folk singer Oh, and yeah. I, I interviewed him about his life and he could with equal measure bring back memories anecdotes from every decade of his life wow yeah. um um but that is quite unusual he sounds a bit like super recognizers have you heard of them i can imagine what you're getting at but tell me it sounds interesting well, well you know how the police hold uh, identity parades Mm. Um, and uh, only about uh, three out of ten people reliably identify the, the, the criminal. They all point to the ugliest person, or you know, <laughs> the tallest, or or whatever, rather than the one that was actually at the crime. Or so this this is a mock up. You know, they they see a crime scene enacted, and then there's an identity parade, and. Hard, uh, there's a small minority who actually get the, the answer correct. They identify the culprit. Mm -hmm. Well, at the other end of that scale, you have super recognizers that can recognize somebody from a fuzzy video on a CCTV camera. Mm -hmm. that you can only see in black and white dimly lit. Mm -hmm. Maybe they recognized him by the gate of his walk or something. And they prove to be phenomenally good. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's just something you're born with, I would imagine. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not something you could learn. I think it was I, I, Oliver Goldsmith. Was it Oliver Goldsmith, the um, American psychiatrist? You know, highly thought of. Mm. But he had the opposite of what you're saying. He couldn't uh, remember anyone. Yes. And yes. his whole life uh, was a series of... Of him apologizing because people would get very upset that they'd meet him in the street and he'd yes. blank them yes and he'd say no no i, I just yeah if someone well, started speaking to them he'd know who they were but from the face he couldn't remember yeah well that you're right it's the opposite end of the spectrum mm -hmm. and that that phenomenon is called face blindness and mm -hmm. some people are so suffering from it that they can't recognize members of their own family yeah that would be very extreme wouldn't it Mm. Um, um so and of course that's so when you when you interview people about events you're you're up against that that whole spectrum of memory and yes and, and detail uh, and some people have are very imaginative oh yes um that's their personality yes. and what they tend to do is an event happens to them and they regard it as very important and they enjoy telling that event to other yes. people yes but every time they tell it it's slightly different it gets better it gets better <laughs> so if you're interviewing someone about something that happened in 1950 mm. uh just imagine how different <laughs> that yes. has grown yes. uh, from the actual event they witnessed well we all like to go down well with our audience don't we so <laughs> a little bit of embellishment is very welcome <laughs> but you can always tell when it's a, a if you like a fresh or genuine memory because the person themselves will momentarily stop almost to look at it 
as if it as it's coming out of their mind uh-huh. and then they'll, they'll they'll say something and, go, and they often put their hand to their mouth and they go oh yes yes you know and, and it, it's like and when that happens you can be pretty sure that what they're telling you is pretty accurate oh, right. it, mean, it means they probably haven't thought about it since it happened so they haven't there hasn't been the opportunity for uh, embellishment ah right i see now on our recent shows we've had uh, paleontology that was last week and uh, so that is pre-history isn't it is mm. it, you can't have a fossil unless it's the, the description of fossil is it must be before the written word something from really ancient time yeah yeah then we, we also had a show on archaeology mm. which seems to me to overlap it can go back yeah before the written word mm. but into man's history where you know there's traces like bits of crockery and fire embers and bones that were hacked and stone tools and things is that your t- domain or is that not your domain no i'm not an archaeologist um i know a reasonable amount about the archaeology of sussex um from having read about it and also having been fortunate enough to have known some of the great archaeologists that this county produced, um, including Con Ainsworth, who some of the people listening to this may remember, who was a remarkable man over who over decades uh, led archaeological digs. Um, And then there was Mark Roberts, and he was the man who was responsible for overseeing the dig at Boxgrove, where you may remember they located the oldest fragment of hominid in the British Isles, oh, half, yeah. a mi- half a million year old tibia. Yes, yes. And that excavation was going to be for a year and then it was two and then it was, it ended up being nearly 10 years of uh, excavations. Wow. Um, so of course, and, and that's mind boggling because you think, well, the Romans were here 2000 years ago. Yeah. Um, the people who dug the flint mines up at Sisbury and so forth started their work about 6,000 years ago. Yeah. But this is 500,000 yes. years ago. And, yeah. and you can't, you just, I mean, it's just so long. No. no uh, and it's, it's, and it's before Homo sapiens. These, these are, these yeah. are human like, but they're not humans. Yes. 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 Homo um, sapiens is generally regarded as having been 200 years ago, although there's dispute. Well, not 200. Sorry, 200,000. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, like, yes, of course. It, and I think there's a lot, of, um, a lot of, of, of disagreement about when did modern humans yes. evolve. Um, yeah. Um, but, but as you say, you can only really talk about history when you've got some sort of written document. Yes, yes. So we're very lucky. You mentioned, um, uh, where was it? Uh, the 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 five hundred year old Foxgrove oh, uh, Foxgrove mm-hmm. but we've also got Bigner haven't we the Roman yeah uh, and, and Fishbourne for the yeah. Roman period Roman palace and Roman manor house or farmhouse yeah, but, um, yeah. And, and earlier than that you've got um, quite a lot of Neolithic <clears throat> you've got the encampment at Whitehawk which is Neolithic and then you've got lots of Bronze Age burial mounds. Yes. Uh, the most impressive being the Devil's Jumps at Hooksway, uh, mm-hmm. right in the middle of the West Sussex Downs. Um, and, and for the Iron Age, you've got all the hill forts. Wow, yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah, th- there's an awful lot of archaeology in this county. Mm. Um, uh, you, you, uh, you're not going to be spoilt for choice. <laughs> and more recently, going back to history rather than archaeology, we've got quite a lot of last world war memorabilia as well haven't we mm, yeah yeah which is you know it's still within living memory but 20 yeah. years from now um it will be. yeah and, and something very fundamental happens i think when an event in history steps outside of living memory because all the time it's within living memory there's an interface between the people who remember it and the historians 
Yes. But once the people all die, then the historians have got it all to themselves. <laughs> um, and, and that's a very, very different. I mean, I Dominic Sandbrook did a series a few years ago about the 1970s. Yes. I, I don't know if you watched it. I like him. Yes, he's, he yes. does music as well, doesn't he? I don't know. He he's done his good music. More um, recently. He might, he might have done. Um, um, but um, he... You know, it was a good series, but occasionally he'd say things about the 70s and go, hang on, it wasn't like that. <laughs> it wasn't like it. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I remember, um, yeah, when would it have been? 90, oh, goodness me. Oh, the fifth. yes, it was the 50th anniversary of the end of the Second World War. Mm. And I did a series of talks about uh, Sussex in 1945. And, and I, there was quite a bit of hubris and discontent um, when I did these talks because these people were coming along who remembered it. And what was this guy in his 30s doing telling them yes. about what happened in 1945? Yes. Uh, which at the time I thought, well, you know, I've researched this. I've looked into this. Yes. You're, but, of course, now at an older age I can start to, well, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, if, if a 30 something started telling me about the 1970s i might get a bit annoyed <laughs> yeah, that's right yes well i've got uh, young children as you know and uh, so we we occasionally go and do a bit of history um i like uh, the oh what is it over by goodwood the trundle no no the the open air museum oh the wheeled and downland yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i like that Mm. And, of course, then there's the Bluebell Railway. We can go and have a steam train ride just just down the road a bit. And, of course, um, also in Sussex, I think that's East Sussex, though, there's the Piltdown Man hoax, isn't there? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, of course, the, the fact that that was believed for so long mm. when it was such a wretchedly poor forgery... Yes. Tells you a lot about the politics of archaeology. Yes. Uh, that archaeology as a serious discipline was created in England. Yes. But by the Edwardian era, the Germans seemed to be doing better at it than the English. <laughs> and of course, this was the era of great rivalry between England and Germany. Yes. Um, and the Germans found in Germany this ancient hominid. Yes. Yes, they christened uh, Heidelberg Homo Heidelbergensis. Yes, yes. So what the Piltdown forgery was saying is, ah, oh, we've found something even older. Yes, we've got one too. <laughs> yeah, and all the archaeological establishment so wanted to believe it. Yes, that yes. for decades they did, but when it was finally exposed in the nineteen fifties, you know, they, they, you know, people said, well, how, how for all this time. How will we take it existed because yeah. it was such a bad a bad fake <laughs> well ours was better than theirs you see that was the motivation it was it was yeah, yeah. but dawson was already dead i think it was his name was dawson wasn't it who came yeah up. i think i think all the principal players were dead by the time it was exposed yes mm. so that made it safe and then politically of course this was just after the second world war when germany had been defeated for the second time yes so of course it hadn't got that incendiary quality to it. You know, the, yeah. the, the forgery could be exposed without national humiliation following. Yes, yes. Well, I, I want to get you talking about lots of other things, like mm -hmm. uh, Blake, for example. And I, so we're going to sing his song in a minute. And uh, <laughs> But uh, before then, you've got uh, some stuff to show us, I believe, about your exploits. Uh, yes, yes. So I'm very fortunate in that I, as I said earlier, I manage a number of um, community heritage projects in Sussex. And so we're just going to have a look at a couple of them. One that is coming towards conclusion and the other one that's only just begun. So if we go to the, um, the Bellot Broadwood one. Coming up. There you go, you got that? Yeah, yeah, I've got that. Um, so, um, so there's the there's the title page for everyone. And if um, it's um, www.belloc-broadwood.org.uk, but if anyone listening just puts in belloc-broadwood, that should bring it up. Uh, so, um, 
the image you're looking at there uh, is a group of people singing songs in Rusper Church, and the lady conducting them is Emily Longhurst, who is uh, the songs teacher on the project. And they've been learning songs that were saved from oblivion by uh, Lucy Broadwood, who was a folk song collector in the late 19th century. And she went around the country districts of Sussex and Surrey, noting down these songs. And without her effort and her zeal, uh, a huge number of these songs would have simply disappeared. Mm. Uh, so we taught her songs, but we also taught the songs that Hilaire Belloc wrote himself, and he wrote them in the folk idiom. Mm -hmm. um, um, so part of the project was the, singing these lovely songs, and lots of people came together. You can see there's a good group there. On other occasions, we had even more people than that singing. But we also were looking into the history of these two individuals and their lives in Sussex. And um, if we scroll down the website, um, and there we are. So coming up, here's a, there's a picture of Lucy Broadwood uh, as, a, as a young woman, and on the right, Hilaire Belloc as a young man. They weren't exactly contemporary. Uh, Lucy Broadwood was born in 1858, died in 1929. Hilaire Belloc was born in 1870 and died in 1953. Um, now, as the name Hilaire Belloc suggests, uh, he came from a French family. He was born in France, um, but very shortly after he was born, um, France was defeated by Prussia in war. There was revolution, and then his father died. Uh, so his widowed mother, who was English, brought him back to England, and he uh, grew up at Slindon in West Sussex. Oh, yeah. And, and then in early middle age, uh, he moved to Kingsland in Shipley, where he remained for the rest of his life. Mm. So Sussex was his adopted county, but he had a deep and abiding love for it. And you often find that, that people who adopt a country often feel more strongly for it than people who were born. I mean, you can think of, um, you know, the fact that uh, Napoleon was a Corsican rather than a Frenchman. Yes. Um, Hitler, of course, was um, Austrian, not German. Stalin was Georgian, not Russian. De Valera was really American, not Irish. Uh, except, and um, I mean, even Churchill was half American. <laughs> so, um, uh, um, and I think Belloc was a turbulent character, uh, particularly in his middle years. He was always on the go, either physically, geographically moving around from country to country, or um, figuratively, he got involved in many uh, religious, political, social disputes, and Sussex for him was a place of retreat and comfort. Uh, and he just he he loved the peace and quiet of the South Downs. Um, mm -hmm. And if we go down a little bit further, John, I'm um, just thinking yeah. because I remember Hilaire Belloc as a poet. And yes, uh, yes. am I right in, in thinking that his poems, some of his poems at least, were comic? And that's probably how most people remember him. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, the bad Charles Book of Beasts, for instance. Oh, right. yes. uh, and and uh, the cautionary tales. Matilda, who told such dreadful lies, and um, Henry King, who died through chewing bits of string. And uh, oh, that's, so that's often how people remember him, uh, which is a bit unfortunate because he was a very serious and intellectual character, but he had a great sense of fun. Uh, and he loved to um, puncture pomposity, mm. which was one of the things that was he was very keen on. Um, it, doesn't it? it? Well, it certainly does. Um, so now we're, we're here, and so if people go to the home page, they'll see these recent posts. So they'll see that I put a little quote up there from Bob Copper, and Bob Copper was a great admirer of Hilaire Belloc, and Bob himself followed in Belloc's footsteps. Um, um, Belloc's, one of Belloc's most famous books um, is, is The Four Men, which, um, along with The Path to Rome, are generally considered his two most outstanding pieces of writing. And it's a fictional account about a journey across Sussex from east to west uh, in 1902. And as you read the book, you suddenly realise, or it dawns on you, that some of the characters aren't real at all. They're all part of Belloc's imagination. And uh, 
Bob Copper retraced the steps and wrote a book about it. Um, and the thing that distressed Belloc considerably towards the end of his life was that the peace and quiet and natural beauty and the slow rhythm of agricultural life was giving way to modernity, to urbanization, to motor traffic, to traffic in the air. And he said, even if you sit on the green sward of Chanctonbury Ring, you can now hear the machine, uh, ma the machine gun fire of a motorbike as it goes down the road at the bottom. Um, and one of the curious things about our current crisis is that we have almost the countryside has almost been put back mm -hmm. into the era of Belloc's youth. Uh, so I've been walking on the downs from Worthing all my life, and hardly ever have I walked and not heard motor traffic mm. or aeroplanes or chainsaws or tractors. But now I can walk up to the downs and all you hear is birdsong and bees and the wind. Lovely, isn't and, it? And although no one would want it to have come about in this awful way, um, we have been given this gift that we can now go into the countryside and enjoy it as no one alive has ever been able to um, yeah which is quite a, and so one of the posts on here uh it's got rather provocatively the coronavirus and belloc and broadwood now of course they didn't actually predict of course the coronavirus but both of them did predict that modern society if it carried on its present path uh would basically implode on itself um unless it was more in harmony with its natural environment so this little article that you brought up here, another picture of Belloc there, uh, quotes both Belloc and Lucy Broadwood um, about how they perceived um, the 20th century, really. Um, and uh, they both spoke with a remarkably similar voice. Um, there, there we come down, picture of, uh, of Lucy there, uh, a silhouette. Uh, she was a remarkably uh, intelligent, well-read person. Um, and she didn't really have any barriers. She was happy to consider any proposition that came her way. So although she was born in a very wealthy family, uh, the Broadwoods were piano makers. Um, yes. And uh, I think Broadwood pianos are still available. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, so she had a great personal wealth that allowed her to do all, all the things that she did. Um, but her she was incredibly broad-minded uh she was interested in uh, in aspects of the supernatural as well as science uh, she was interested in mainstream anglicanism but she also was very interested in esoteric eastern religion um so um and then right at the bottom here as you scroll down now this that virus a letter from a virus uh was posted by an italian onto YouTube about a month ago, and it's very provocative about the effect of coronavirus, but it ties in extremely well in its philosophy uh, with the ideas of, of uh, Lucy Broadwood and Hilaire Hel Belloc of over a, a hundred years ago. Mm. So it's really trying to make, you know, I think bo um, both Belloc and Broadwood wanted people to think beyond the material benefits that they were getting from from modernity and seeing the dangers that were implicit with that as well so so this project you know on one hand it's all about having fun it's all about singing songs it's all about as you say that the nonsense poetry but then there's this serious side this very philosophical theological side um and so hopefully if people have time to to look at the website they'll be able to delve into it and and, and just see what fascinating and, and rich characters these two people were sprinkled with videos as well yeah uh, lots of videos yes you can play you can hear the songs being sung uh, and this man here whose picture we're seeing there that's mike hennessy and mike hennessy is chairman of the belloc society now i've attended many talks in my life academic talks historical talks literary talks mike hennessy's talk about belloc and wine is one of the most genuinely intelligent talks I've ever heard. Not pseudo-intellectual, intelligent. Uh, and he draws on 
uh, on the history of Europe and ties it up with the history of wine. So anyone goes on to the website, they can hear that talk completely free, the whole talk, and I think they'll find it uh, totally enthralling. And they can have a glass of wine while they do it. Yeah, that, that would help considerably. <laughs> <laughs> so shall I bring up the other website? Yes, yes. Mm. Okay. Right, now, so as I said, the, the Bellop Broadwood uh, project has been going for two and a half years and it's reaching a conclusion. This one, South Downs Generations, uh, actually only got the go ahead shortly before the lockdown. And this presented a huge challenge because one of the core pieces of work of this project was going to, was, was that I was going to go into primary schools in the South Downs and in and with the with the teachers and the children explain oral history to them and we were going to then groups of small groups of children with myself or a teacher would then go and interview one of the old people in their village about the changes they'd seen in their lifetime mm. well you can see of course that is the very last thing that anyone could be doing at the present moment in time so we've yeah. had to We've had to completely reconsider the project yeah. and do things that we were going to do at the end, at the beginning, and do the, the interviews that we were going to do at the beginning, at the end, <laughs> yeah. because hoping that by September the schools will be back. So what we're doing at the moment is we're doing two things, and people can go to this website and find out all about this. We are uploading extracts from existing oral history interviews. So these are interviews that I've conducted, other people have conducted in the past. And we've got little extracts and we've put them on the website. And the two that we've put up, I think people will find very interesting. There's one about a manhunt on the Downs in 1934, uh, where a policeman had been shot by a burglar. The burglar went on the run and the police trekked for him over the Downs. And he tried to break into Myrtle Grove farmhouse. and. 22 years ago, I interviewed the daughter um, of the man who lived there, and she remembered all about the events. And she, she's, she remembers it with such clarity as if it was only happened last week. Um, and she's also very amusing. It's worth listening to her interview because at the end, uh, she controversially um, reminds us um, that um, the man was actually shot by the police, um, but the police said he shot himself. <laughs> so it's, there's a, a quite a bit of controversy there and, and the other post if we just go back up uh, or down john now now that people will see that illustration there that pen and ink illustration that is rough music now rough music was for many many years a form of community justice so if you imagine living in a south downs village and someone in that village had offended the community, but hadn't actually broken a law. How did they get redress? Well, the way they'd do it would be to assemble outside his or her house in a large group like that. Actually, John, if you can click on read more, yep. there's, a, there's a better illustration, hopefully. Uh, if we go down, ah, yes, go down. Now, this is marvellous. This, this really shows rough music and you can see these are just the men of the village with their caps on but look they're holding milk yeah. churns frying pans yeah. uh, cudgels drums and they they just make this awful noise that's not a photograph is it that's an engraving that's an engraving and it's an excellent one it's Isn't so it? so good and so if people if it, quality. it's yes it's very very good um and if people go to the, the, the there's an interview with Nobby Kinnard of Clapham Village, and he remembers the last rough music in Clapham Village, and he oh. describes it. Um, uh, so that's that's a real gem. Uh, and over the next weeks and months, we'll be putting more and more of these interview extracts up on the website, and I really encourage people to go on there and, and give us feedback. And also, there may be some people listening to this either themselves or their relatives or friends who would be able to um, give us their memories as well. One of my former colleagues, the history teacher at the school that I was teaching at at the time, 
used to really get into entertaining his classes by dressing up in appropriate costume for, for the period. Um, yeah. And so I guess that you could be, if we ever get out of lockdown, you could be leading groups of school children to do rough music around the village. <laughs> that, that would be real enactment, wouldn't it? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Um, it, 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 it was a very powerful tool, though. And in towns, uh, I mean, in the village, the rough music group would be 20 or 30 people. Yes. But when rough music took place in Worthing in the 19th century, it could involve two, three, four hundred people. Wow. Yes. Imagine just how intimidating that was. Yes. Yes. Um, and so often the, the, what people people would get rough music, typically a man who was uh, alleged to be um, treating his wife badly. Yes. Uh, knocking her around or parents uh, who were abusing their children or yeah. people who acted or people who had acted dis dishonestly but there was no evidence in a court of law to prove it but everyone in the community in their gut knew that they were dishonest yes uh, rough, and they would get this rough music and rough, um, rough justice well that's it is rough justice uh, mm -hmm. and if people were really angry they'd come with an effigy of the person <laughs> which they would scream insults at and then set on fire <laughs> I thought you were going to say stick pins into it. Well, it's, it's not far off that, is it? No, no. Um, and people were driven out. Uh, I know of about three cases in Victorian Worthing where people were driven out of the town permanently uh, as a result of rough music. So, and the, and what the police force in Worthing at that time was twelve constables. Yes. So what are they going to do against yes. four hundred angry people banging drums and, and yeah. They look, they look the other way, wouldn't they? Yeah. yeah. Now you mentioned Victorian Worthing, and it reminds me of a certain playwright who lived there for a while. Ah, Oscar. Mm. Yes. Yeah, a handbag? Pardon? A handbag. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, important to be in earnest. Um, he did, yes, he stayed at the Esplanade during the summer of... Um, 1894 mm. right yeah shortly shortly before his arrest yes um and at that time when he was in worthing he was consorting with uh of uh, of youths youths in the town mm -hmm. uh, including a 14 year old newspaper boy called alphonse conway ah uh, right yeah and um I, I got into hot water a, a few years ago when I uh, had a book on the history of Worthing published. Um, I suppose it must be 15 years ago now. And, and I made the observation um, that actually, even today, Oscar Wilde would be arrested because these these young men were below the age of 16. Oh, right, yes. Uh, but that caused a bit of furor because there's a lot of uh, uh, feeling about Oscar Wilde and people thought I was being there. Uh, um uh prejudicial i think but i was just really making the, the the comment that actually he was a very educated uh middle class literary person yes and, and these lads were working class fairly uneducated and very oh. very uh amenable to his charms <laughs> yes yes well we've got a question here that i'm going to throw in front of you to see how you uh take it can you read that uh this is the restaurant. Freedom was the fruit of that culture in the past. Views detract from the <laughs> No, well, that's a, that's a very well made point because Belloc's religion was everything to him. And it was very amiss of me not to mention it. I suppose because we live in such secular times, uh, we, we can forget about the importance of religion. But Belloc. Uh, as a young man was very very influenced by uh cardinal manning uh and cardinal manning who converted from anglicanism to catholicism said that ultimately all conflict is theological so it's almost this idea of a battle between good and evil and you had to know whose side you were on um uh, and belloc felt that uh that that modern capitalism grew out of a a secular, irreligious uh, 
uh, mindset, um, which I suppose in, in everyday language we could call greed, and that greed couldn't be sustained indefinitely, and in the end it would end up uh, sort of consuming itself. But he was also not a supporter of what we'd call communism, because he'd say, well, under communism, everyone becomes a slave of the government. So you don't want to swap being a slave of the capitalist to being a slave of the government. So he, he had this, perhaps people might think, rather romantic idea of, of late medieval Europe, where there were uh, peasants who owned large amounts of land, enough land to feed themselves and their family, and any surplus they sold at market. Uh, mm -hmm. and that, so his, his idea of freedom was that unless you had enough land to feed yourself, you couldn't be free. Even if you were earning a million pounds a year, you were still a wage slave. And so he had this idea of distributism, that the land should be distributed to the people of a nation because they should. that is a basic uh, human right. Mm, interesting yeah. idea. Mm. Treat the land a bit like the sea where everybody gets a share of it, as it were, without actual ownership. <laughs> and he wrote a lot about the sea as well, John. So um, it, one of his books was called The Cruise of the Nona, which was this small, very old yacht he had that he used to sail around the coast of England. And as he sailed, it, it, the meditative quality of the sea helped him to think, and he wrote. And many of the things he wrote in that book, uh, which at the time people would have thought were eccentric, we now can see as being quite forward-looking. Uh, so just to give two examples, he said, if we carry on the way we are, within a few generations, all people will be slaves of the banks. Mm -hmm. And the other thing he said was, everyone's talking about the rise of fascism and communism, but everyone has forgotten the burning flame of Islam. Mm -hmm. And so in the 1920s, he was saying communism and fascism will... They're a big threat, they're a big problem, but they will disappear because they're man-made. Mm -hmm. uh, but Islam, Christianity, these are much more profound belief systems. And anyone who thinks Islam is just going to fizzle out is uh, sorely mistaken, mm. uh, which is quite remarkable when you think that was written 100 years ago. Absolutely, yes. Well, it certainly hasn't fizzled out. I went to Manchester University and spoke to the Islamic society there just to... Mm back in February, so yes. <coughs> oh, just before the lockdown. No, yes, before lockdown, that's right. Mm -hmm. That question came from Conrad Didiodato, who is uh, watching us from Canada. Hello, oh, Conrad. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much for that excellent uh, point and question, yeah. Yes, yes. Right, so um, I wanted to get you to talk a bit about uh, Blake and mm -hmm. Harry because between them they made a big impact on the UK, didn't they? <clears throat> yes, uh, William Blake's poem, um, which people often don't think about the words, uh, but of course it's not just a romantic, idealised pastoral hymn, it's actually uh, a pretty savage attack on urbanization industrialization you know dark satanic mills yes yes you know, satanic that's a pretty strong yes expression um uh, and did those feet in ancient times walk on england's mountains green and he's a bit like belloc blake is linking um the ancient religious history of england with where it had arrived at his point in his life which was the industrial revolution the rise of the cities, the factory system, which he despised. Um, so it, it, it's it's a revolutionary song, really. Yes. Um, and but it was only a poem. It was only a poem for a hundred years, and then Hubert Parry. Um, Can we just well, locate these people? Parry lived in Rustington for a while. Yeah. Yeah. So Blake Blake lived for three years at Felpham. Yes. Uh, near Bognor. Um, um and someone can correct me on this i think it was 1803 to 1806 uh, but if it's not those exact years it's about then um and he was arrested during that time because uh, a recruiting sergeant was going around the village to get men to enlist in the napoleonic wars mm. and he according to blake he drunkenly walked into his garden 
And he said, I'm here on the king's business. And Blake is supposed to have said, damn the king, uh, wow. for which he was arrested for sedition. Wow. Um, but he was acquitted uh, because his good friend Haley, the poet, uh, hired a very good attorney for him and, uh, and got him off. See, it's uh, who you know. It's, uh, it's who you know uh, ever since. Um, but, um, but Hubert Parry, uh, he was, uh, he was uh, actually Hubert Parry, there's an interesting connection, John. Hubert Parry was uh, a friend of uh, Lucy Broadwood. All oh, right. And Hubert Parry, of course, was interested in bringing English folk music into classical music. Oh. As, well, as was Ralph Vaughan Williams, Percy Granger. Um, so uh, Lucy was a great influence on those classical composers. Mm. And um, Parry, uh, who was a supporter of the suffragettes, uh, thought it would be a jolly good idea to put music to Jerusalem yes. and, and then the women could have this as their anthem. Yes. And, and this coincided with the creation of the Women's Institutes. Mm. So, you know, today we think of the Women's Institutes as, you know, um, woolly jumpers and pots of jam. But really, over 100 years ago, it was it was a very radical departure. Yes. Um, and uh, and another sad connection is that uh, Parry died of the Spanish flu at the end of oh. 1918. Yeah. Mm. Uh, a, a victim of that uh, epidemic. Mm. Uh, which, of course, killed up to a quarter of a million people in England in yeah. that winter. Yes. Well, it's a it's very resonant of today, isn't it? But you you're talking about um, Jerusalem being a rebel poem. Mm. What about is it the fourth verse of the the God Save Our Graces the national anthem? What, oh, what? damn the Scots or something, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> we never sing that far, do we? No, no, we never sing that. Well, because that song was uh, "God Save the Queen" or "God Save the King," as it then was. Yes, was written as the Scottish Jacobite army was marching towards London from Derby. Yes, and of course, actually, it turned back and and didn't reach London. But there was panic, so this great patriotic song was written. Yes, uh, inc yes. including. Um, confound the scots i think it was i can't yeah. remember the exact phrase yeah mm. <laughs> so where do we go from there oh what about you mentioned brexit mm. is there any roots in history to the way we feel about the continent oh definitely without a shadow of a doubt i'd say um if you go back, obviously you can go back to 1066 and the Norman Conquest. Yeah. Mm. And we are still, our prejudices are still formed by that event. Now, mm. if I was to say to you, or, or you were to say to me, two of the, we've got two people watching this, this um, program tonight. One is called Bill Smith and the other is called Philip Legrand. And one of them lives in a council flat and the other lives in a great big house near Ashington. Who would we naturally assume was living in the big house in Ashington? Not it's Bill. Not, not Bill. Yeah. It's going to be Philippe Legrand. Yeah. You know, okay, I, I said Legrand, uh, but anything French and people pepper their conversation, you know, je ne sais quoi. Yes. Why is that impressive? Yes. Because French implies learning, sophistication, upper class. Yeah. And you don't really hear it so much now, but certainly when I was a child, people would, would talk about, Oh, that's very vulgar, very Anglo-Saxon, you know, yes. and and uh, villains. The police are uh, after villains from the old Norman French word vilain for peasant. Yes. Um, so that's there. But if you come into more recent history, um, you've got um, the Spanish Armada. And you've got England standing alone as a Protestant country facing continental Roman Catholic Europe. Mm. And the Spanish Armada and the Spain, people must remember that Spain in 1588 was the global superpower. It was the yeah. equivalent of America. Yes. England was not the equal of Spain. No. England was, was a second rate player. Yes. So the chances of an English fleet being able to defeat the Spanish were small. Yes. And the Spanish failed because of the weather. 
this yeah. huge storm that came up and sank the Armada and scattered it. Mm. And uh, the first, I believe it was the first commemorative coin in Britain was struck. And on one side of the coin, there's a map of England. And on the other side of the coin are all these galleons sinking and <laughs> a face popping out of the clouds, blowing at, with the legend, God blew and they were scattered. Yes. And this created the idea of the English being almost a second Israelites, God's chosen people. Yes. God had intervened miraculously yeah. to save them. Yes. Um, and, and I think those two events, 1066, the Spanish Armada, and then you've got subsequent things like the gunpowder plot, yes. which of course was a Catholic plot and therefore a European plot. Yes, yes. Um, and even small little things that are humorous, really. But when um, when this country adopted the um, the Gregorian calendar, having mm. followed the Julian calendar, mm. you know, why are we having to adopt the single European calendar? You know, that's what people. Uh, so yes. I think it's deeply rooted in our psyche. Yes. Deeply rooted. We want April the 1st to be the first day of the year. Yeah, yeah, all, all that. And and, um, uh, and uh, even in the Victorian era, there was huge uproar um, about Roman Catholic practices being reintroduced mm. into the Church of England. And mm. there were riots and protests, but these people rioted and protesting weren't really very religious they just saw this again as catholic europe trying to yes. control us yes they were anti-europe even back then <laughs> yeah it's been, it's been a long strand in our history for good or ill chris it's been fantastic yeah, I've, I've enjoyed it very much thank, thank you. you very much and and thank you everyone for watching so and did those feet in ain't